Hello and welcome to another lecture from my class, PSYC 770 Psychological Testing and Assessment. Um, today I'm beginning with a, uh, another great web comic uh, from PhD Comics. This is a series that I would highly recommend to really anyone in academia, especially if you're a grad student or maybe a postdoc or an early uh, career um, professor. It's really funny and at times sort of touching and I, I, it's really great. Uh, this particular comic doesn't have a, a ton of ref relevance to today's lecture, uh, but I think it identifies a problem that probably most of us are familiar with. So anyway, today's lecture is on standardization, and it's going to be a short lecture, um, not because standardization isn't an interesting topic, just because I only want to talk about it a little bit right now, and the last few lectures I know have been rather long, so I wanted to do a short one. So what will I cover? Well, standardization. I'll talk about some of the issues and important questions that come up when we try to develop or use norms for a norm reference test. So what is standardization? Standardization is the process that a test developer goes through when he or she is trying to gather norms for a particular norm reference test. So establishing uh, a mean or a range or estimates of dispersion for a particular test that can then be used to interpret individual test scores. Now, in order to do the, this, the test developer has to answer some fairly basic but important questions about the population that is being considered or is being studied here. So who are the people who we're, we are trying to measure? Are they uh, people of all ages? Are they people in the adult years of their lives? Are they people from a particular racial or ethnic or cultural group? Are they people of a particular gender? Um, are they people with certain features of psychopathology and so on? Um, and th again, this may seem sort of obvious, but it's really important if we are trying to develop, if you're a test developer and you're trying to develop a, a measure of a particular personality trait, presumably this is a personality trait which is measurable, at least in some amount, in all people. Um, if you're a test developer who's trying to develop a measure of alcohol-related problems, are you talking about problems among people who are young drinkers in the sort of college years of their lives, 18 to 25, let's say, or people who are older? Uh, are you, if you're measuring, uh, developing a measure of gender roles, are you talking about uh, the population of just women or just men or people of different uh, gender identities and so on? So if you are a test developer, one thing you'd be trying to do is think basically about who are, who are we testing here? Um, what are who are we trying to compare individual test takers to? So down the road, once this test has been developed, when it's being used by a clinician or by a researcher, who is that person who the test is being given to being compared to? Um, in order to do this, in order to define this population, we have to identify the key variables that define it or that uh, identify people who are members of that population. Now, assuming that a test developer can do this, at least in some in some way. You know, they've identified broadly, or maybe more specifically, the type of population that they're studying. They know that they can't gather all members of that population and administer their test because that might be uh, practically or even in principle just impossible to do. So they instead, of course, choose to sample from that population so as to be able to estimate important features of the distribution of scores in the population, estimate parameters like the mean, the standard deviation, the interquartile range, and so on and so on. Now, how interpretable uh, these estimates are as norms has a lot to do, of course, with the nature of the sampling that was used to draw that sample or gather that sample. And if you've taken a class in research methods as an undergraduate or graduate student, you've probably encountered the idea of random sampling. People sometimes confuse random sampling with random assignment, like in experiments, but they're different things. And random sampling refers to the idea that if you are sampling from a population, you could, at least in principle, uh, give every member of that population an equal probability of being drawn into your sample. So you could imagine 
it's finding everyone in a given population, giving each of them a number, and then using some sort of random num number generator to spit out numbers. And each time a number comes up, you contact that person who's corresponding number, and you recruit him or her into your study, administer your measure, and so on. If you did that, you would truly have randomly sampled that population. Uh, now, this is probably easy to do in some areas of science, or relatively easy if you're doing research with plants or other non-human animals where it's maybe easier to define a population, or at least the population doesn't move around as much in the case of plants, um, that may be relatively easy. In humans, of course, this is really, really hard to do. You could, how would you even uh, give everyone in the United States, let alone the entire world, a number and then contact them and be assured that if you contacted them, they'd be willing to be in your study. So in practical terms, random sampling of a population is pretty much never done. What is sometimes done instead, at least by professional test development companies, is stratified sampling. In stratified sampling, we do, or the test developer identifies key variables that are important to defining that population, and then tries to select precise percentages of people within those uh, subgroups and then use those as the sample. So I might say, well, my population of interest, if I'm a test developer, is all adult people in the United States, and I think variables like gender, race and ethnicity, um, maybe uh, socioeconomic status are all important, and I'm going to uh, come up with coding schemes for each of those three variables, and I'm going to try to uh, create like a matrix that defines all the possible combinations of those different levels of those variables, and within each combination, sample a precise percentage of folks. So a certain, you know, I want to have, let's say, 50% of my ultimate sample be men and 50% women, or maybe 50 you know, 40% men, 40% women, and then 20% people who identify as neither men or women, or, you know, people of different ethnic groups and so on. Um, this is pretty difficult to do because it involves uh, identifying these variables and then coding them, and then, of course, all the work of trying to get balanced or appropriate percentages of people in all those cells. So uh, it's sometimes done, it's probably rarely done except by companies who have the time and the resources to do the heavy work of, uh, of sampling in this way. What is more commonly done, and what you're probably familiar with if you've ever done any research as either an undergraduate or graduate student in psychology, is convenience sampling. Uh, convenience sampling uh, may involve identifying uh, groups based on key variables and may involve trying to get some people in the ultimate sample from each of those groups. Um, but that effort is, you know, a good faith effort rather than a precisely uh, mathematically defined effort. Uh, so you might say, well, yeah, I am going to, I, I, I want to s develop a new personality measure. I work at a university and I'd like to gather people uh, from the broad population of adults in America, but practically speaking, I'm going to be recruiting from the undergraduate research pool, uh, pool at my university, so most of the folks will be in that kind of 18 to 25 year old range, and they'll be disproportionately white or Caucasian, and they'll be disproportionately of uh, middle or higher socioeconomic status, and they'll of course be disproportionately a higher of higher education status than most other folks and I may try to reach out to the community and recruit some people of, from lower SES or from other ethnicities but if I can do it great if I can't no biggie I'll just I'll just keep going that would be an example of convenient sampling and convenient sampling is commonly done but of course there's some real limitations associated with it limitations which probably psychologists and other researchers who, who work with humans are, are, are not you know, as quick to acknowledge as, as maybe they should be. Um, the biggest one, or the biggest way of describing the, these limitations, is just that it's sampling error. You know, we're trying to draw from a population, but those samples we're drawing are unrepresentative. And in, in previous lectures, of course, I've tried to pictographically demonstrate what this might look like, but I think you get the idea. It's possible that my ultimate convenience sample might not 
be all that representative as kind of a microcosm of that broader population that I wish it to be representative of just because I didn't have the right mix or the right balance of all the different combinations of people defining all the different combinations of variables. Um, to the extent that I proceed uh, with interpreting individual test scores with results uh, with um, in, in connection with these uh, biased, uh, this biased sample, I may end up with um, biased results or this, uh, I may end up committing uh, potential testing bias because I have a particular person who I'm interpreting with respect to a sample that isn't all that representative of the population that I think that particular person is part of. If that last slide sounded a little, a little bit muddled, um, here's the important point. Um, we're trying, with norm reference tests at least, to make a comparison between an individual and a population. So how does this particular test taker stand with respect to all the people that are in the population that we think she or he is a member of? Now that link or that connection that we're trying to make, that comparison we're trying to make, really uh, only works via the sample that we've gathered for that particular test, the standardization sample. And so in a very real way, our ability to use a test in a, in a valid way in a, um, is really only as good as our standardization sample. If we have a really good standardization sample that we feel confident is very representative of the population, then good. You know, our test, you know, it may have other problems associated with it, but it won't have that problem of sampling error and the biases that can accompany sampling error. If our standardization sample is pretty limited or, or problematic, then our ability to interpret the test in a useful, valid way is severely uh, constrained. And I noted this before, but I'll note it again. Um, an important point here is that professional test developers and publishers um, have the time, have the resources often, hopefully, to develop good standardization samples which will yield good interpretable norms. So if you as a clinician or as a researcher are turning to PSYCOR or Pearson or any of the other big test publishers, chances are the tests that you buy from them, often at great expense to you, will be uh, developed using large standardization samples which are very representative of the populations they purport to represent. And the technical manual will provide exhaustive details on the standardization process and on the uh, final norms that were uh, developed for that test. So uh, a lot of what you're paying for, you know, if you've ever purchased uh, professional tests like the MMPI or the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale, you may have just shook your head at how expensive they are, thousands and thousands of dollars. Well, a lot of what you're paying for is all the time and all the effort that goes into developing a good uh, standardization sample. In contrast, tests that are developed by academics, by clinicians, by people working at university, maybe people like you or indeed people like me, um, may not be so good because their samples, their standardization samples may not be so good. And I don't mean to pick on academics or clinicians for that matter. I am one of I'm both. Um, I like this line of work. I respect this line of work. Uh, but the point is, if someone has developed a test of a new personality trait or a new feature of psychopathology or a new aspect of emotional functioning uh, that you've read about in a journal article or a book chapter, that's great. And maybe you want to use that test in your clinic or in your research program or so on. Um, that's great or that's fine, except you should be very, very careful to take a look at the standardization sample and what is published, hopefully along with the test, about the whole process of gathering that sample, uh, testing the members of that sample, and developing the norms for that sample. How good are those norms at estimating the important parameters in the population? Do we have a very representative sample or do we have what's sometimes called the college sophomore problem, which you may be familiar with already, but essentially refers to this idea that a very large amount, indeed the majority of psychological research is done on college sophomores who tend to be disproportionately white, educated, affluent, uh, et cetera, et cetera, as compared to the broader populations that this research is supposed to refer to.
A further important point is that norms change over time. Uh, the, you know, this is something that if you, if you have friends who are not in the behavioral sciences, you know, psychology, sociology, anthropology, or who are instead in the hard sciences, they'll sometimes joke about this or point this out to you. You know, the atomic weight of hydrogen isn't changing, or at least I don't think it's changing since like the, the dawn of the universe. Um, However, norms uh, for things like extroversion or narcissism or anxiety or so on and so on, the things that we in the behavioral sciences like psychology study, those things probably are changing over time. And of course, it depends a lot on what we're studying. There may be some features of, of psychology, you know, broadly, that are fairly stable uh, across the, the years and the decades, but there are probably a lot of things that aren't. And again, if, if you, um, if you, uh, you know, have ever purchased uh, psychological tests, you, again, you're aware of how expensive they are. You're probably also aware of the fact that they're um, revised every few years, hopefully. So there's the, the, you know, the MMPI, the MMPI-2, the MMPI-2-RF. Um, the reason why these tests are revised, or at least one of the reasons they're revised, is the expectation that those things that are being measured aren't stable in the populations that we're interested in. So levels of extroversion, levels of narcissism, levels of depression may be changing over time. So the ability to put or make a comparison between an, an, an individual test taker and that population is dependent on using the current and the best norms available. Um, earlier on in the lecture on ethics, I pointed out that one of the ethical responsibilities that test users, that is clinicians and researchers who administer tests, have is to use the most current norms available. You, know, you may not want to spend the money to buy the newest version of the MMPI. You may be more comfortable using an older version of the MMPI uh, just because that's what you learned in graduate school or that's what you like better for any number of different reasons. But ethically, responsibly, you ought to use the newest and the best tests, even though it costs more and takes you time to learn and etc, etc. Hey, that's part of the process of being a critical thinker, a critical user of tests, and it can be really interesting too. Uh, at the risk of opining further on this point, um, uh, you know, every couple of years when I teach this class, I have to do a pretty significant amount of work to update my lectures, revise all my slides, learn any new revisions on any of the tests that I, I try to teach on. And it's a lot of work. And sometimes I, I just shake my head and think, oh gosh, why am I doing this? Other than that, well, it's my job. Um, well, part of it is it's, it's, it is my job. It's also, I, I like to think of it as my responsibility as an educated uh, user of tests and teacher of tests. Okay, so I promised this would be a short lecture and it was despite a little bit of my uh, digressions, uh, you know, on a few points there. Preview for next time, I'll be talking about measurement error or a, a source of measures, different sources of measurement error, and I'll be making a connection between measurement error and reliability. I'll also talk a little bit about validity, but much of that is for a future lecture. So that's all for this lecture, and as I, uh, as I always say, thanks for your attention. I hope you find it interesting, gave you something to think about, maybe some important points to take with you as you learn more about tests and use tests for your research, for your clinical practice, and so on. If you have questions for me, uh, if you're in my class, of course, ask me by email, via Blackboard, via in-class, face-to-face conversation. If you're not in my class and you're just watching these videos on YouTube, hey, that's amazing. Good for you. Thanks. Um, but uh, post a uh, question or comment in the in the comment field, and I'll do my best to, to track those and respond to them uh, as quick as I can. So thanks so much, and I'll be back with another lecture, a somewhat longer lecture, really soon. Bye-bye.